Wizard Magazine number 27 for November 1993. My name's Ed Piscor. I am Jim Rugg. Let's get into it, Jimmy. And right here we have a Jim Lee cover, man. We're going to have his third interview in 27 issues, if you do not count uh, the announcement for the image uh, creation and a few other interviews done with Image Founding Fathers. Heck of a cover here, though. One thing that uh, struck me was when, when you think of Grifter and you draw him, is he a blonde or a redhead to you? Gosh, I, I guess I would say blonde. I always thought of him as a redhead, but then Spartan is definitely redhead. And then I started to think, Jim Lee has two gingers on the same uh, <laughs> on the same team. Uh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that team is just nuts looking. It is, man. And the fact that the C in Cats is covert. Right, right. <laughs> I had the software. Did when you I was, really? I, I absolutely did. And uh, the computer that I had uh, at the time could not save things, man. So I spent a whole day uh, oh. adding all my comics into the database. And when I thought I had it on the, uh, on the, on the little floppy drive, it wasn't there the next day, man. And I systematically never used it ever again. Yeah, I've never, I've never used, I've never uh, put my comics into a database of any kind. K favors out there, if there are any good uh, database things like this now, put something in the comments because I might use an app and, and catalog some of the crap that I have. I, I think that would be a good idea. We're gonna have to do an episode at some point about organizing collections. Bongo Comics is getting called out, man. I think they had like one or two comics that were out in the wild, man. So they're expanding their line. Uh, they just recently quit ceased publication within the past six months or so. Last summer, I bought um, all four of those at a garage sale across the street. Crazy universes continuing sludge. I always like this image. Never saw the comic or even looked looked at, at an issue, but that image is stuck in my head over time. Steve Gerber, man, you should track that thing down. Spawn ad, almost monthly from Image. Big draw. Any big takeaways from the Garib Shameless letter from the publisher? Nothing. Yeah, nothing here uh, in the letters column from, from, from me either, except uh, for some guy who's extolling the virtues of, of Quasar and gives like a lengthy diatribe about what makes him great, and he is glomming is it- on to the X-Men uh, Iron Man debate and says Quasar can F up all of those guys. <laughs> like, let's not even waste oxygen on the debate between uh, Iron Man and X-Men. Is that Fife? <laughs> Who wrote that letter? Hey, Fife did uh, come from Florida on his way to New York, <laughs> man. So this might be a, a nom de plume, as they call it. Envelope art is really cool. And uh, one of the things that, like, I guess I never really put much thought into because I never did a piece of envelope art, but the paper of an envelope is really crappy. And these guys do great work with the medium that they have available. I love this Death's Head gold. I didn't really know what this was. Often whenever gold is associated with a comic, it's like a gimmick cover. It's Mm -hmm. some special variant. But apparently this is its own issue, and I just passed this uh, yesterday in a shop for a dollar, and it's written and penciled by Liam Sharp, who I think is a pretty interesting artist from this time period. And I guess he's, you know, I mean, he's still working today, but this is about whenever he came on my radar. Yeah, so my, myself as well, I, uh, I'm glad to know that this exists because I had no idea that it was out there. The fact that he writes and pencils it makes me want to seek it out. Is it worth a dollar? Mm, maybe 50 cents. <laughs> Wizard News, we talked about it in earlier episodes when we saw the first Plasm ads, man. Marvel takes legal action against Defiant because the Jim Shooter-created superhero team called Plasm, the name kind of butts up against a character named Plasmer that Marvel UK had on on their docket. And to illustrate that point, they just show the two logos, similar color schemes. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's about as close as it gets. This seems like uh, corporate tactics. Absolutely. Pressuring you know, somebody small and new that maybe even if they're legally right would, would struggle to compete in a court. There was lots of money in comics at this very moment, and that is the kind of trickery and, and snake stuff that, that, is in, that is standard operating procedure when there is actually money involved. What ultimately happens is that Defiant does win the case. It isn't close enough uh, for there to be an actionable offense, but to the tune of about $300,000 that Defiant did not have, and, uh, you know, say la vie, in very short yes. order. Ouch. 
Claremont goes to uh, DC and he strikes like a pretty pretty interesting deal with the company in that his Sovereign 7 is a uh, creator owned. Like he owns this stuff. I don't know that it came out this early because I seem to remember it being solicited around the time when I had a subscription to John Byrne's Wonder Woman and that would be at least a year, year and a half later. Yeah, I can't remember how long it ran. This was a book that was on my radar. Dwayne Turner doing the artwork. I was a fan of his. And of course, I was a fan of Claremont from X-Men. So him returning to a superhero team seemed great. It was not. At least I don't remember liking it much. But I think it ran about 18 issues or so. So, you know, it's possible it was still coming out whenever Byrne takes on Wonder Woman. I can't remember when that was. Uh, yeah, I can't either. It was uh, 94, 95, I guess. Art T-Bear and Kiko Taganashi join Extreme. I uh, There would be the Extreme covers and stuff that would have the, the, the very striking AT on there, but I actually never really associated him much as being a member of Extreme Studios. It be, I think because he did have a career before then, and I, I think of Extreme Studios as like the young upstarts that Rob Liefeld sort of groomed from, from the beginning to be part of uh, his crew. And of course, Kiko Taganashi, man is like the badass colorist. So he's like he's like the Steve Olive of, of their crew, or he's like the Ruben Rude or the Joe Ch- Chiodo of like Extreme Studios. All the best coloring that you saw in um in the Extreme Studios books was usually the product of Kiko Taganashi. And I would uh implore the K Fabers to find a TMS IDK, tell me something I don't know, interview that Jim and Jason Legs did with uh Rob Liefeld. And Rob Liefeld, you hear him specifically talking about acquiring uh, Kiko in in uh, the fold of Extreme Studios. These guys, when Image first starts doing that digital coloring, you know, well, I guess when Image starts, they yeah. go to that digital coloring, that stuff was pretty revolutionary. Like, um, you know, we've seen interviews with, with guys that talk about the cost of those machines. As a colorist, you didn't buy your own Macintosh in 1993. It would have been cost prohibitive, plus it was new and different, and who knows if it even works. So it was hard to get these guys... And, and finding them, I think that Kiko might have come out of, he came out of somewhere, like Ollie Optics or somewhere. Um, you know, so it was a very desirable skill set that not a lot of people had at this stage. And what would happen is these guys would kind of figure it out, develop their skills, and then branch off and start their own studios or join a studio like Extreme that could buy several workstations and could employ people that then Kiko probably trained and would help kind of establish the look for Extreme. It was such a Wild West at that very moment when uh, Steve Olive was running Ollie Optics and he pioneered computer coloring sort of as it was known at this point pretty much with some software that I believe he either, he was either the first to use it or even had to like write some of it himself or have it commissioned. But he, being more of an artist than a businessman, didn't have, uh, what would you call it, non-compete clauses with the people that he worked with. So ultimately, in a town of like a hundred people, <laughs> there were like four computer coloring houses and it would be people who would, you know, sharpen their puppy teeth with him and then they would branch off and basically make all the money. I have a question for you, Jimmy. Did Trencher in fact live on beyond uh, Image? Because I don't know that that's true. They're saying that uh, this company called Black Ball Comics is going to resume uh, publishing Trencher, but I'm only familiar with the Image stuff. I don't think subsequent Trencher issues were published. I think Black Ball did some anthologies that may have featured a Trencher story or two, but I don't think it was uh, any any more comic books were published that were Trencher exclusively. And we're at the height of creator-owned comics. Uh, the start and the height and the gold rush, and it's all on. So last issue, I believe, we were talking about E-Man is back. This issue... Dreadstar is back. Both of those series, man, would have their little tenures at various, it's at least three different companies. Yeah, it's almost wave two for Dreadstar. Whenever uh, the direct market spawned several publishers in the early 80s, Dreadstar was, is when Dreadstar starts up. Right. Uh, JFK and comics is an interesting thing to talk about just because of the one famous appearance that was going to be in issue 168, and it was about... Uh, JFK and Superman sort of team up, and it was going to be promoting uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, fitness program that he was in, in st- installing, like like across the country or, or whatever. Um, but Superman was te- Superman was teaming up with him. This thing was going to be put out uh, basically the week after uh, JFK was assassinated. They 
pulled the issue off the stands. It actually did trickle out. It's a very valuable comic. Uh, a lot of a lot of the old timers, so many old timers, uh, they say they have it. If that was the case, man, then there would be friggin' millions of them out there. DC Comics reconvened, talked to the White House, and the White House thought it was a perfectly fine thing to do. It wasn't uh, in poor taste in any way, shape, or form. So then it ultimately became issue 170 of Superman. Ed, do you know comic book talk show? I don't know this. Uh, I, I did a little bit of digging and couldn't find it, although the main guy, his name does show up in some videos, but he has Neil Gaiman, Chris Claremont, and Jeff Smith are listed in this description of what sounds like almost a cable access or, you know, like a local kind of comic centric show. Yeah. Yeah. I was not familiar. Uh, actually I, uh, you know what? I do know that guy. That's just Tony DiGiolarma. He came to the Kubert school and like talked and, and would do like promotional art. So he would draw like a Venom t-shirt, but never drew like a Venom comic. So I actually do know that guy. And, and he's been at conventions that, you know, I've been to a, a lot of times. Seems like a kind of a go-getter guy. Uh, but I'm sure this is like public access kind of thing. And there were a lot of these all over the country. In fact, uh, one of the people in like the Rising Stars section that we're going to talk about later, Dan Fraga, the way he met Rob Liefeld and many of the creators that uh, that are sort of his heroes and that he's friends with was when he had a, uh, pu a public access show when he was like in middle school. I like the fact that they have Fantagraphics news. So let's see what's happening with Fantagraphics at this point in time. Uh, Peter Bag's Hate is in pre-production as a full-length animated film by Colossal Pictures. Uh, this property seems to have been optioned routinely ever since then. I remember actual uh, commercials on television, I think during the Super Bowl, like 10 years ago. Um, the other thing that they're pointing out is, is uh, Liquid Television, which would have a lot of cartoonists from the Fantagraphics camp, Drew Friedman, Mark Beyer would do some stuff that would be animated on that anthology series. Highly recommend that series. Big influence on huge. me. Yeah, huge. That that was one of the most fascinating things I had seen up to that point in my life. Yeah, yeah. Do you have a Do you have a favorite that came from there? I always liked a, a, a stick figure theater where they would take public domain audio, like the Hindenburg yes. disaster or or Night of the Living Dead, and on notebook paper, uh, just animate the sequence. Obviously, Aeon Flux. Yeah. I can't get away from that. But there was also a skateboarder. I think it was Stevie Washington, Wasted Youth. Uh, and it's in this very crude animation, like a lot of just like side-scrolling kind of background scrolling past. That stuff I like a lot. Yeah. Very simple. I always look at it and think like, you could do that now with After Effects or something. Singularly. You know, in an afternoon. Right. Uh, but it looks really cool and it's cool drawing. Speak up. Gimmicks, bonus, or bogus? This is a topic of conversation that's come up uh, plenty of times. Yeah, that's my only note for this because we're going to... I'm going to reference this whenever we get into the next piece. But it's basically talking to a couple of fans and getting their perspective on comics, state of comics, and mostly on things like gimmicks, variant covers, and, and that sort. And they're against it. Beyond the Spandex. And it's uh, Patrick Daniel O'Neill just uh, talking about like what makes a superhero iconic, like like uh, beyond the costume and stuff like that. And one of the things that he points out about like just like what makes Batman great is that he has, get ready for it, solid motivation. <laughs> Criminals are a superstitious and cowardly lot, the old Bill Finger line. So that's a solid motivation in the world of uh, four color, all in color for a dime type shits from back in the day. It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> like, like his editorials are so disconnected and looking back on them now, who's he writing to at this point? Just like, other like we're, dudes. Full of, we're We're looking at a magazine where guys are talking about variant covers, Jim Lee, uh, creator ownership, Wildcats, all of this stuff that's completely disconnected and separate from every month. It yeah. just, it's just bizarre. <laughs> and then I like that the Flaming Carrot is like the mascot for his editorial here on superhero origins and well-written superhero motivation. And then Flaming Carrot's the character that's stuck in there. That's just that's just art director trolling him, right? I think so. It, yeah, it doesn't. It's incongruous to say the least. Exposing Covert Activities, yet another Jim Lee interview uh, in the pages of Wizard Magazine. And uh, what I like about this one, Jim, is that we're really starting to see some names that are going to bear fruit uh, much later. The first real mention of, uh, as I called him at this time, Travis Cherist. 
I don't know how you say the poor guy's name. If anybody knows, let me know. But I'm going to keep falling back into that because that's... I, there are many words that I only know from reading on paper. I'll point out this is two months after the Jim Lee death blow wizard issue. And right. now he's back on Wildcats. There's some interesting stuff in this one. Um, Travis Tress is, is one of the guys that I pulled out to, Ed. That was an artist I really enjoyed who did a lot of work for Wildstorm over a couple of years, mostly Wildcats work, including some with Alan Moore um, that Alan Moore wrote. Uh, one topic, cover gimmicks. So, you know, two pages ago we were looking at fans' idea of cover gimmicks and whether they liked them or not. So here Jim Lee says, fans are tired of this. And that's what we just saw, you know, a couple of pages ago. So there isn't going to be a cover enhancement for the ongoing Wildcats. It's not even starting over at a new number one. It's just picking up where the miniseries left off. This is something McFarlane has said and pretty consistently since we started, since, since Wizard number one, you know, whenever asked about all of the gimmick Spider-Man covers that sold three million copies, McFarlane's like, Marvel did that. Whenever he comes out with Spawn, there are no cover enhancements, there are no variant covers, no multiple covers. It's one issue, it's one style. A so, dollar twenty, a dollar ninety-five for many, many years. So I feel like, uh, you know, it's it, it's kind of in the air, th this idea, and it's pretty smart play by a creator to stand up and say, hey, fans are tired of this, Marvel's still doing it. Jim Lee doesn't say that here, but I mean, like, lots of companies are still doing these variants. So for a guy who gets to control and call his own shots, I think it's a good move to stand up and make this point. You're sort of on the side of the fans, you're listening to them, and you're responding. But I will say, within a year, Gen 13 is launched as an ongoing series, and issue one has 13 variant covers. <laughs> so, you know, it's... Uh, Come see, come saw. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's still no question that, that number one fever is still a thing at this point in time. And he could have easily made far more money if there was not issue five, but issue number one again. In the same way that, like, Larson had to do with uh, with Dragon and uh, Valentino. These guys are were not doing the millions of numbers, like, with the Marvel books. So it behooved them to make a little extra scratch by restarting and rebooting the series from the jump, man. Another bit of awareness and, and sort of, I don't want to call it fan service because I think it's real legit. Like he heard feedback about the Wildcats miniseries and uh, this new, you know, as the series picks up, it's going to be more straightforward because the feedback he heard is that the miniseries con confused some readers. And I thought that was really smart. You know, like, like a guy who's starting to write his own stuff and trying to launch his own characters, taking into account what's coming back critically and trying to apply that to make it better going forward. Pretty smart. I think so as well. And there is mention of Gen 13 on the horizon in this interview. And just earlier in the news segment, we read about the scuffle between Defiance, Warriors of Plasm, and the Marvel UK character called Plasma. And they changed Gen X, which we've seen in many advertisements for months and months at this point. It's now called Gen 13. He says, uh, I think disingenuously, that it wasn't meant to, uh, like, the X wasn't meant to, like, confuse people with, you know, his very popular run on X-Men or anything like that. But um, there was not only going to be an ine inevitable Generation X comic coming from Marvel, but you really don't want to mess around with those Marvel UK characters, man. And they had a character called Genetics, which the lawsuit would surely have been uh, hinged upon. Yeah, and Gen X, I'm sure, is, is also just a play to Gen X, right? I mean, that was the popular terminology for our, for everybody in the 90s grunge at a certain age. Grunge was called grunge, and he wore flannel. Yeah, and, and that part didn't change. The Jim Lee timeline, pretty cool. 1986 is whenever he breaks in, and he does so with a book called Wild, Wild Boys, um, so, you know, note for uh, people that are interested in my 1986 imaginary zine. Right. Uh, this is one more note for uh, stuff that happened that year in comics. This is always a great thing to see. Any kind of like little kibbles and bits I could get about a cartoonist's origin, because then I would record these issues and then go on the hunt at Pittsburgh Comic Con and try to scoop some of these babies up. He addresses um, connection between Sin City art style and Deathblow art style. Says that he showed... That, that, Clearly, he owns it. He says, you know, I was inspired by Sin City's art style, thought it was great, did some pages or some sketches, sent them to Frank Miller, got his blessing. So um, I think we've referenced that it's it's very much a Sin City style, and, uh, and he's basically saying, yeah, 
that's exactly right. <laughs> and it's it's such a weird period of time where where I really do think these are like the first like regularly successful uh, self publishers uh, uh, creator owned properties like the Ninja Turtles thing that was like that was like an anomaly or something. It was also starting from a position of nowhere. Like the Turtles guys didn't think they were going to sell millions of copies. Sure, it was yeah. sort of like we're just making this little tiny operation. Yeah. It is weird for a guy of of his stature, of Jim Lee's stature, to suddenly have nobody to run an idea past. Like he's the guy. Right. And they're just like super kinetic. Just just constantly on a move, doing a million things. He's expanding his studio to about 30 people at this point. So he's like, you know, he's in love with Sin City and he's he's bolstering that. And he says stuff like, man, I would love to work with Jim Lee on that. Like, like he almost so he's confusing it for being like some kind of like random ass creator own thing. Like, oh, yeah, man, like, let, let me let me do a couple pages in the issue. It's like, <laughs> get the fuck out of here, man. <laughs> <laughs> he really does say that shit. Here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um yeah, Steve Gerber's mentioned here. He's going to be writing the uh, the Wildcats yearbook, and then there will be this piece in the back that is talking about like creator owned versus work for hire. We're talking about Gerber and the fact that he is probably one of the first guys to really like make some noise about um, the creators getting some stakes when like a hot property is created on a lark. He created the Howard the Duck character that received a lot of feedback to the Marvel offices that ultimately resulted in Howard the Duck getting his own series, which became super popular. And he's famous for saying that, you know, if he if he got complimentary copies of Howard the Duck number one and sold like five of those things, he would make more than he did actually like making the comic back in those days. So, you know, he made Destroyer Duck to help sort of like offset some legal costs in, in uh, some some scuffles with, with Marvel to try to get uh, gain a little bit more equity. So they're asking, like, what, like you're back to doing creator-owned stuff. I mean, uh, fork for hire stuff. You're doing things for Marvel. Like, like what, what's the deal? And he explains that it's just not, it's not like you just, it's not binary. It's just do or don't. It's like, let's have some fairness, you know? Yeah, the point with Howard the Duck like royalties weren't a thing. No, you know that doesn't happen until I don't know mid '80s or something. Like 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 post Ronin or around Ronin, I think DC changes that. You know to give creators royalties, and Marvel then has to follow suit to kind of keep up. So you know, Howard the Duck is back in the '70s. Yeah. You know you were doing this work, and if it did catch fire, if it was lightning in a bottle, to, you know the creator didn't see that part. And things have changed. Like back in those days, uh, I. One could make the argument, and it's never been tested in court, but one could make the argument that you were signing contracts under duress because if you're spending a month writing a comic or drawing a comic, that's the more labor-intensive part, I would say. You're spending a month drawing a comic. Now you get this check, and when you flip it on the back, you are signing your rights away if you put your name on the check and you need to pay rent the next month. If that's not duress, I don't know what is, but it's never been tested because how are you going to, you know... If you need that rent check, man, you don't have a pro bono lawyer who's going to be so kind to, like, test that. I have one more note on this article. Let's hear it. Jim Lee talks about, like, this radical idea of jumping ahead to issue number 25. Yes. And then you would see ch characters that were changed or maybe dead or whatever and not know what happened. And then you'd go back and tell the story moving to that point. Sounds familiar, Jim. Yeah, well, it doesn't happen with Wildcats, but it does happen with some of the extreme books that Rob Liefeld puts out. Interesting. So, like, Bloodstrike comes to mind. Yeah. And I think there were a few other titles that he used that in where it was like, I don't know, they were on issue 7 or 8, and then they published issue 25. Jim Lee lays it out in this in this interview as kind of a throwaway idea, and I think Rob Liefeld must pick it up and go with it. The unexplored medium. Jim, can we talk about Alan Moore a little bit? Finally got an interview with the man in this very issue. Yep, first thing I see, the interviewer asks him, why comics? You know, he, he's written books, he's obviously a very talented, creative guy, and his answer is, quote, we have yet to produce the first great comic novel End quote. And this is the guy who wrote Watchmen saying that, man. So for everybody on their high horse about this is like the greatest crowning achievement in literary history, it's real good. It's real fun. But even Alan Moore is like, get off your fucking high horses. <laughs> this is a... Uh, that's one of those kinds of statements, though, like, you know, we're still waiting for the great American novel. Yeah. So, like, discount, you know, Hemingway and whoever you want to put in that argument. 
it's kind of it's very subjective obviously of course but things have changed a lot in the 25 30 years since this interview and i'd be curious what alan moore's take on it is now I agree. and i would like to see somebody put together a good canon of comics and, and really consider like what are the outstanding works they talk about his early days and this is where many people discover that not only has alan moore been writing comics for about 17 years but he wrote and drew a bunch of them about 500 pages worth of comics. Roscoe Mosco uh, is one that comes to mind. That was in a music magazine. I forget the name of that mag. But uh, there was also Maxwell the Cat that had uh, four volumes uh, in, in uh, published in America. I am real glad you say this, Ed, because this is the part that stands out the most in this interview to me. He is making a living from those comics over the course of a couple of years and realizes at some point that uh, he can't draw. I've looked at some of those comics, and they look pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, they're totally amazing. Like, they look just like, uh, the, like the best of the underground comics of the late, mid to late 70s. You know, very, very manic, lots of detail, and, and very readable. The guy knows the form. So that was, that was a, a super cool revelation to a lot of people, I'm sure. He also, uh, at that point, he identifies that he doesn't think he can draw well enough to really make it. Yeah. And at that point, he starts sending scripts out. And I think that's telling, you know, like if you're a cartoonist who wants to do this for a living, like that's some real honesty. Like that's assessing your body of work and sort of adjusting what you're aiming at, you know, adjusting your your plans because you do want to be successful and you don't believe you have the skills to do this particular model or to do it a certain way. Um, not everybody does that. Like we, we meet a lot of cartoonists and it comes up and, and I hear a lot of cartoonists talk about how impossible it is to make a living in comics. And certainly it's not easy, but also are you prepared for that kind of brutal honesty where you sit down and say, I can't do it this way. I've got to change something. And one of the things that I've identified in the people that I speak to who are, uh, upper echelon, most successful, they do have that, uh, they do have that self-awareness that, uh, that really does separate the champs from the chumps. Getting to Marvel Man a little bit, and he, this is one of those places where you get to see him uh, talking about Harvey Kurtzman and the influence that Harvey Kurtzman had had on his career as a boy. He got these like mad uh, reprints that uh, were floating around out there in Britain, and got an issue that had the classic Super Duper Man story that was illustrated by Wally Wood, and this just blew his mind because he would get those comics. And he kind of like had certain feelings about the silliness. So he liked it, but he had certain feelings about this. And the, the fact that Kurtzman and these guys were even allowed to deconstruct and make a little bit of fun of this thing really stuck into his mind. And at this point in the, those 60s, Marvel Man existed, uh, Mick, drawn by Mick Anglo. There were first the, the Shazam reprints for a long time, then that license goes away probably because the character has to go away uh due to dc legal and stuff and and marvel man uh shows up the next month since alan moore was a kid he wanted to play around and do like his super duper man version of marvel man he gets the opportunity in warrior magazine to play with the character and his way to parody the strip was to just try to look at it from a different angle which would be let's call it semi more realistic you know like let's have a little bit more real world pathos like built in there and try to make these characters like reference the silliness of the old comics you know that was a part of like the 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 early genesis of his work on uh what we know in america as miracle man i was surprised that this was his first superhero comic i didn't realize that and it's also his first ongoing series with room for a complex story yes and uh when he wraps up his tenure on Miracle Man, he already finished Watchmen, and he considered Watchmen to be like his ultimate statement on superhero comics that he did always kind of like feel silly. Um, but he still had several issues to go with Miracle Man, so he calls it his like post ultimate uh, superhero statement. And if you read those last uh, couple issues up to like fifteen sixteen, you see what he means because you read those issues and it's like, well, what if Superman did win? and uh, have to, like, display his power. How would normal people react uh, if, you know, you have this god amongst men? He'd probably act lockstep with whatever he deems as being good and wholesome. Well, before we get to his current uh, stuff, there is the John Constantine character. 
And one of the things that Alan Moore is uh, is known for, and I don't hear enough of these old writers talking about uh, the idea of like working in tandem with the artists to like make the story. Famously, Alan Moore is known for doing that with the people that he works with. And in the case of Swamp Thing, with uh, John Totalbin and Steve Bissett, the art boys wanted to have a character that looked like Sting. Not the WCW champion, but the guy who was in the band called The Police. <laughs> As they say in The Wire. The thing that uh, Alan Moore talks about here that's really fun, very Alan Moore-like, and this might be before his 40th birthday, I'm not sure, I didn't do the math, but it's his 40th birthday when he makes the 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 declaration to friends and family that he is now a magician. But we have some magical thinking and some magical ideas in this article when he talks about, like, yeah, the sting thing, like, yeah, that's whatever, the boys want that, and so I'll, I'll, man I'll manufacture that. But he was talking about, like, in pop culture, the, the mystical bard was always, like, some old fuddy-duddy with, like, a wizard hat or something. But, like, let's, what if we have, like, a blue-collar occultist? You know, Alistair Crowley, if you read about Crowley, Crowley's a rich boy. What if you have a blue collar magician or occultist, somebody that has the stuff uh, that that's happening to them and, and knows about like what's really going on behind the matrix. And Alan Moore was out getting lunch one day at a snack bar and in walks, he almost said a guy who looked like Sting, but it wasn't. <laughs> it was a good man who looked exactly like John Constantine as Moore calls him. And Constantine uh, took a look at uh, Alan Moore, who was sitting at his table, maybe scrawling some notes, eating some things at the snack bar, and winked at Alan Moore and turned the corner. Alan Moore was debating, should I like get up and like see if he was even really there? But he played it safe this go round and thought that it would be a good move to not to just like let sleeping dogs lie, as they say. But that was the inspiration, and that's what he brought to the character. I wonder how many times he's told that story. Because that, that's a story I'm familiar with, uh -huh. and I can't figure out if it's from this interview, and it's like the one piece that, that I remember from reading at least this issue as a kid. Like, that's the one story I remember, so I wonder if he's repeated that all over the place several times, but it does stand out, so kudos to him as a storyteller. I agree, and, and you know, like, one, the one thing I did discover is that cartoonists do develop their sound bites, and one of the people who... Uh, who sort of drew, drove this home for me very recently is the great Bill Sienkiewicz, who just received an Eisner Award for some uh, for his artist edition, actually. Um, year two, 2019 is when we're recording this thing. And uh, when Bill Sienkiewicz is up there on the stage, he said that uh, people say all art aspires to music, but I say all art aspires to comics. And if you go watch the Bill Sienkiewicz <laughs> shoot interview that we did in our archives he says the same thing there and is able to like add a couple pregnant pauses and such to make you feel like he came up with that on the spot. <laughs> it's like a good comedian. Very well done. <laughs> so right now, Alan Moore is working with Image Comics. He's brought back uh, to superhero comics, man, with the promise of very, very lucrative paychecks. One of the series that uh, is near and dear to my heart, I believe it's near and dear to your heart as well, Jimmy. 1960 motherfucking three. Yeah, this is the antidote for Watchmen in a lot of ways and everything that followed Watchmen. And again, testament to Alan Moore kind of looking at the big picture. He's looking at, at Marvel Comics and Image Comics and similarities to kind of the revolution and the moment that we're in. So going back 30 years to 1963 and channeling that energy and the type of comics that Marvel used to change the industry back then. Great kind of like fourth wall stuff. Uh, in terms of design and the entire package. Uh, a lot of like the, st the st um, Stan Lee hyperbole in a lot of the mastheads. Dandy Don Simpson could do a mean kind of Artie Simek impersonation. We have a lot of the uh, the design elements of like the Marvel's letters pages and editorial pages that were uh, throughout these things. And I got these comics before I knew who the creators were. They fooled me. I thought I knew everything about comics and the fact that there was like a whole new company with a whole new sets of characters I knew nothing about. You know, they're referencing uh, Mystery Incorporated number 85. Like, where the heck have I been? Yeah, it's a very complete package. And it's a time period completely different than what I was reading and what I was seeing. And if you want to see an example, you know, this is, this is the coloring of other books that I was buying at the time. And by the way, this is Alan Moore's Violator, which is coming out around this time, drawn by Wizard's own Bart Sears. 
but you can see, you know, a massive contrast between that type of coloring and something like this. Right. This is like the last vestiges of like four color process, man. Like using actual zipatone for color separations and such. It's really kind of brilliant. You know, we talked a minute ago about uh, all the optics and the computer color as supply and demand issues. Alan Moore circumvents that with 1963 using a very traditional approach to color. And lo and behold, it stands out on those stands. You know, it's, it's completely different than everything that we were seeing and everything that was selling in big numbers at that time. It was like, what is this stuff? And, uh, you know, just, just Alan Moore doing something different, standing out, you know, looking at the comics landscape and, and zigging when they're all zagging. This is like the 1963 version of the image universe. And the, and there's six issues that have come out. And to date, and in the interview, they're talking about building up to what will be the final the final issue. Perhaps the Tomorrow Syndicate issue is out on stands while this interview is being conducted. So the idea is you have these old 1963 versions of these image characters, and then juxtaposing that with the modern day spawns and the young bloods who are the 1993 versions of like what an image comic is. So the idea is to marry the old and the new and we see small glimpses of that in this issue. Look at that very Ronin inspired piece. That's right a nice there. picture and the next spread you're gonna show. Awesome. Yeah, so they go through this this uh sort of portal or whatever, and they're going through basically the history of modern creator owned comics. We have Colleen Duran's A Distant Soil, Dandy Don Simpson's Bizarre Heroes, Rick Veach's uh Max uh Maximortal. Maximortal, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jim Valentino's old work from Normal Man and Captain Everything. Frank Miller's Sin City. Michael T. Gilbert's Mr. Monster. Uh, Bacchus by uh, uh, Eddie, Eddie Campbell. Campbell. Dave Sims, Cerebus. Scott McCloud, Self Portrait. Chester Brown. Bob Burden's Flaming Carrot. Dave Gibbons of uh, Martha Washington. Frank Miller. Tyrant. That's going to be a Palmer's Picks in an in a is, issue near you. Larry Martyr, Bean World, Jim Woodring, Frank. Well done, Ed. It's amazing. You passed. Man. This was incredible. I didn't. I probably didn't know right. a percentage of these characters. But you start to see the color changing a little bit. So you got these old characters, man. And we're starting to see some molding and modeling. They're emerging into 1993 now. And look at this guy coming through the portal, right? Spoilers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's, he makes his way into the 1963 universe, and here he is. He's pulling off that mask to reveal... <gasps> Shaft! <laughs> from Youngblood, with so many trapezius muscles. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have all the modern uh, image characters. And what was going to happen with the promise of the entire, the culmination of all of this stuff was going to be the 1963 annual illustrated by the great Jim Lee. And it was going to, uh, the way that it's described here, which is something that you and I could replicate on our own in a pinup or something like that, man, was to have the four color process characters fighting, or at least in tandem with the Ali Optics, Kiko Taganashi, computer characters. Oh, it'd be so great to see. I'm going to have to do a pinup. Yes. Like, like, who would you choose out I of love these the characters? Fury, but I also like, where's that? This guy. That yeah. guy's awesome. Yeah. And man. The Fury is huge for me. He would have been my first choice, but like, it, I, I think I'm going to have to like do a pinup pin with the old school color and then do like chapel, <laughs> him fighting chapel or something. <laughs> But to date, uh, when this interview is being conducted, Alan Moore really only has one piece of work that is outstanding, that has not been finished. Uh, obviously, right now, we know that there are at least two pieces of work because the 1963 annual uh, did not come out. Jim Lee did not do it. Uh, it, is, it is not there. But the other series at this point that has been uh, outstanding, that is not completed and probably will never be completed, is his collaboration with uh, Bill Sakevich called uh, Big Numbers. Yeah, only two issues saw print. 
mostly from Alan Moore's self-publishing imprint, Mad Love. And I think it may have been co-published with Tundra or yeah. one of the issues co-published with Tundra. There are pages that were, um, I guess, roughed out for subsequent issues, at least issue three that float around, you can see online. Um, and Al Columbia, I think, drew some pages, but then destroyed them. So I don't know that those exist in any form. Um, but a far cry from what he envisioned for a complete story. Yeah, he says it's his, mo his most complex work, and, and he says he leaves his artists in a in a smoldering pile once they uh, try to visualize some of these ideas. It's very complex subject matter that uh, that he's trying to unpack here, and, and like from what I gather, it's like there seems like there's chaos in the world, but if you get a big enough number, say the population of the entire world, patterns emerge. Is that about the That's idea? Right, yeah. So how do you illustrate that in comic book form in any small, simple way? Yeah, he's incorporating ideas, I think, too, of gentrification, living in a city, um, architecture. Like, there's all kinds of ways that he's trying to approach illustrating that concept. And, man, those first two issues look good. I guess they took their tool on Bill Sienkiewicz, but he, he seemed up to it, at least for the first couple issues. Yeah. What what does uh, Alan Moore have on the racks now, even though uh, Big Numbers isn't done, isn't, isn't going to be complete? Because he still has uh, other creator-owned projects that are not Image Comics. Yeah, that he refers to as his serious comics. Mm -hmm. And so one of them is that he's talking about is From Hell. Uh, From Hell had been serialized in Taboo up to this point, but then Taboo goes away, so he's talking about the uncertainty facing From Hell. Of course, From Hell is ultimately finished, but what happens uh, in between the finished version of From Hell and Taboo's end is that these things are released in compilations through Kitchen Sink, and, you know, it's what we know of as From Hell. They're just uh, collections from Taboo, and I think it runs about 16 parts or so. And it takes about 16 years for these guys to complete the thing. Very ambitious. In all of the beautiful. texts that we have read uh, while this thing was being serialized, it's uh, a fictional story. It's it's uh, Alan Moore like, coming up with some, some ideas about who could have uh, killed Jack the Ripper, all that. Yeah, when fictionalized, it, when, but heavily researched. Super researched. Uh, but I bring that up because when it gets collected and it's, it's nearing completion and it's being published by like Eddie Campbell comics so like when he was self-publishing mm. it um they were manufacturing the narrative that this is like the most plausible uh possibility right. like like that it was a piece of non-fiction in a way so it's fun watching these stories develop and how like you know this is cave called kayfabe for a reason but the other big uh story that was taking forever for them to, to work on uh, was actually just recently completed within the past decade, was uh, Lost Girls, Alan Moore, Belinda Gebby, his partner, can't open up one page of this baby because it is it is, uh, <laughs> it is a porn comic. He, ca he calls it pornography. The difference between erotica and pornography is the amount of money you have in your wallet, he says. <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, taking... Uh, basically, this is like l porn League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. This is like... You know, Wendy from from uh, Wizard of Oz, uh, Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, like, and having them in the, these very sexual uh, scenarios. Big book. It took it took he and Melinda long, long time to put together, and this very affordable volume uh, just just came out within the past two months. Fifty bucks. Um, before this, there was like a two book uh, slip case that was available for like. 100 bucks, 150 bucks. Um, this is something I was always curious about and had to scoop it up once I found it, you know, in this more affordable uh, edition. Haven't read it yet. It's in the to read pile. That's a nice looking book. Yeah. Beautifully uh, designed. Team Youngblood number three ad, boy. Uh, there is a spawn illustration that Chappy App does in here that is uh, sublime. <laughs> there, 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 was, there was an argument between my friends and I because I was far more in the Extreme Studios camp. And uh, one of my exhibit A's, man, was like, look, man, even Chap Yap draws a fucking better spawn. Todd McFarlane was youthful and ignorant. Wow. I, don't, I don't think that anymore. <laughs> but it's a good spawn. All dressed up with no place to go. Jim, not only did the industry and business and the medium of comics progress over the past uh, 30 years, man, but so has cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> I got to dig out my crow costume. You really do, man. Put, put some cards on the table. That Call wolf. attention to one. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking guy, people, let me try to bring this up a little bit. This guy wrapped himself up 
in aluminum foil, man. And just stood stood still. Yeah, like because you know he's getting stabbed. It's it's the death of a thousand paper cuts. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting jabbed like a million times. That poor bastard. I'm happy with all of these. This is a fun feature. I'm I'm on board for this. This is similar to the uh, make your own action figure for me. Uh huh. Because look at these costumes. Like this they're not great. coming off the shelf. Yeah. No. No, in fact, you could see like the toilet paper tubes on that on that <laughs> yes. stormtrooper head, and that just looks eerily similar to like the uh, the Batman from the serials yes, from, exactly from the thirties. Yeah, man, Batman has a gun in that shit. That's a pretty good Joker. It, I mean, Rick, perfect Rick this face, and like this man, like that's like you had to make that it looks molded, you know, and and uh, the strife. Makes me think of if you ever saw that documentary called The Wild Pack about those boys who yes. were like locked in in a apartment for their whole teenage lives, and they would make Batman costumes out of um, cereal boxes because you could see the corrugated cardboard that like makes that helmet and everything. That's an amazing costume, and it's a mirror behind him. But at first, I thought it was a doorway, and it was like he can't walk through a doorway. Oh yeah, I thought that was a doorway, but I do see it's a mirror on the doorway. They have the uh, the Target mirror that every college kid has. One of my favorite parts of all these pictures is the lighting. You know, it's like, it's especially the Strife one is a good example where it's like that interior lighting of like just your overhead ceiling light or whatever. It does so much. Like it's such a strange effect to what's a pretty good costume. But in that lighting, it's like, it's so strange. Yeah, I call it, uh, you know, for for the old heads out there, that is the, uh, the Hustler Beaver Hunt uh, <laughs> uh, lighting. <laughs> well done. Speaking of well done. Amazing. It's incredible. It's so good. That uh, I actually I never had this issue and I pretty much only cracked it open for the first time for for this read here. But uh, I've seen photos of this in in later issues like that I picked up off the rack. Um, so so this shows up several times. I don't know if this motherfucker's like I got a first prize this time. My shit is so good. I'm gonna like submit it again. But you see this exact image in in later ones for sure. My kind of hero. This Oblivion character looks pulled straight from like a Marvel UK. I would buy that. If, if I found that comic in a dollar bin, I'd buy every copy of it. Let's go, Bill McAvee. Make that shit happen. Brutes and Babes. Cover design, Joe Casada. I like this article. I, uh, I, I'm i reminded of the Bart Sears cover design column from several issues ago. Yeah. And uh, quite frankly, I think these covers stand out a I lot more than, I do too. than the Bart Sears examples. And to be fair, they're reproduced at a slightly bigger size too. So that probably helps. There's There's extra levels of thought that are going into this thing and he's he's playing with the form a little bit like sleepwalker magic dreamlike thing this is this is a good use of the logo inverted like like turn it on its i side. love the logo stuff there's a couple exa- like he talks about working with the logos you see foreground object in front of the logo you see a logo being ripped up there i think that's really cool touches K- and still readable kayfabers who are also uh, professionals man quit covering up your logos on issue number ones i see that a lot in Marvel and DC Comics, they do that. It's like, come on, man, let us get acquainted. Let us be able to read it for once. But yeah, even these, I thought this was amazing. I never uh, have seen this this issue, but like just that image, like the weight of that staff and like the skull like laying on it and the fact that the body feels like it's like this real dead weight. He like, he, he captured it, man. Very strong perspective here of the buildings and the way that perspective works around as a wraparound cover. Love it. Classic Quesada perspective like when he starts doing daredevil you'll see this a lot and he does daredevil in around 99 2000 when i went to art school and you saw all the kids like trying to like replicate like that kind of uh imagery playing with negative space here man like cutting his character off like making it feel um constrained claustrophobic good stuff look at this like what i like about this is the character's name is troll and Jim Lee's trolling Marvel by having, like, even a smaller Wolverine. <laughs> so the name works on, like, several levels. Drawn by Jeff Matsuda. I was going to point that out. Have we seen his name yet? Well, uh, we've only seen his name at this point in, like, envelope art. or, wow. or like a, And that's what I'm saying. Like, as we unpack these magazines, th- we are seeing Extreme Studios' names amongst letter art, Wizard Amazing cover art, like... Rob Layfield is seeing the same stuff that we're seeing here, and he's making making some calls. This is a really good article, man. Something I liked a lot, man. It's called uh, uh, what the fuck is it? Eight to the four. A batch of new artistic cream rises to the top, and they make they make some good calls here. 
considering what comics are going to go through in the subsequent years, they really nail this. Like Pretty most much. of these guys are still around and still active. Yeah. So the so the uh, the idea is going to highlight, you know, we've been talking ad nauseum. We did three interviews and 27 issues with Jim Lee. Let's talk about some guys who are like creeping up, man, who are, who are going to be names to recognize moving forward. Number one guy on the docket, man, Greg Capullo. Yeah. So here's an example. He mentions one of his first published works is in Gore Shriek. This is published by Fanico, a company out of Albany, New York that I kind of like. They do horror indie black and white books. This is his story. So this is Greg Capullo. It's not his first work, but it's uh, maybe his third. Good looking stuff, man. Like, uh, Fife swears by his work on Quasar. I don't know and haven't seen much of it, but when he took over after Mark Pasala on X-Force, I was a uh, I was a Capullo guy. I was on board. I love that logo, uh, the way he uh, signed his name even. It's really solid, and it's interesting seeing his name listed here because he definitely goes on to you know, like he just rises, like he just continues to rise shortly after this. Like they have the spawn that he does a couple of issues fill in, but then he'll take over penciling spawn shortly after this for years, Farland finishing. And it's a pretty dynamite look and, and a top selling book for the years that he's, that he's doing that. Um, and then, you know, recently big runs on Batman that have been well received. So it's a pretty long career. He's, he's, he's got at a high level. Yeah. And he keeps, keeps rocking, man. And he's even more muscular now than he was when he was, uh, you know, getting in the game, man. Bernie Chang. Do you know anything else that he does contemporary? No. Okay. Derek Robertson, man, my homeboy from freaking Space Beaver. Let's check that shit out, dude. And of course, Derek Robertson, long career. At this point, he's doing new warrior stuff. But man, he has runs all over the place. Uh, Transmetropolitan with Warren Ellis is probably one he's very well known for. He did the complete run on that, I think. The Boys with Garth Ennis that's now a TV show somewhere or the other. Um, you know, not to mention runs on Wolverine. Uh, actually, a couple of runs on Wolverine, different times. So all over the place. And one thing that he talks about here is being good at facial expressions. Yeah. Which I remember reading back when I was a kid and thinking about because it, it's hard hard to draw that stuff. So... You know, somebody that's good at that is somebody that I would look at. Yeah, yeah, and th and this is one of the great black and white uh, '80s comics, basically, and it, it's sort of same story throughout, man. It's it's the tick trajectory, man, where it's like the store has a very enterprising and talented customer. Store sees customers' artwork. Store uh, publishes customers' <laughs> artwork. <laughs> yeah, does he say that it goes? 10 issues or 11 I've, issues? I've it's issue. a long run. Yeah, it's like eight, 8 or 9 issues, I think. That's pretty impressive for a black and white indie book. The kid was in high school. Jeez. Yeah. Next up, get Glenn Fabry. Cover artist on Preacher, as I know him, man. But he, uh, there's like a very famous and iconic Bane cover that like all the superhero people like uh, jerk off to whenever they, they first saw him. Super arresting imagery. Like that right there, that'll give you nightmares, man. Yeah, I'm with you, Ed. The Preacher covers are what I think of first and foremost with him, for sure. He does do some interiors. He did Thor Vikings. I like his pen and ink work. There are a lot of these painters in comics. When I see their pen and ink work or black and white work, I'm impressed by it. But yeah. I don't see that much. Yeah. I had a series that he did for Vertigo called Greatest Hits that he does, you know, more traditional black and white interiors. It's kind of a superhero. I don't know about revisionist, but kind of a pop mod superhero team. But when I was looking up his bibliography, he does quite a few interiors, uh, many more than I realized. Comes from 2000 AD, and probably the most popular uh, strip series that he worked on then was uh, Slain the Berserker, Slain the Barbarian, whatever. But super muscular. The thing about the painters when they hit their pen and ink stuff is they have far beyond their 10,000 hours of like lighting. Yes. So that's what you get to see in the ink. Like These guys can really like shade a muscle. Jim Ballant, uh, Kubert School student. I don't know if he was a graduate or not. I'm always confused by who attends for a little bit versus who graduates, but definitely a guy I connected to the Kubert School. Yeah. He did a run on Catwoman, you see here. Much praised. For six years, and I don't know that he missed an issue. Right. So pretty amazing. Like all through the 90s, it's like 93 to 99, I think he's doing Catwoman monthly. Yeah, and I guess he's starting right about now doing the thing, and it's, and it's hitting, it's catching on in subsequent wizard uh, issues that we'll be doing. 
there will be fucking three or four Jim Ballant Catwoman costume covers. Yeah, it's bad girl art. And as he moves on from Catwoman, he starts self-publishing under Broadsword. Which I think he still does because he's always at the damn convention. I don't know one person who buys this shit. I've never seen one in the wild, but he always has a big setup and he always has like three or four models kicking it with him. A long-running series tarot that he self-publishes. Yeah. And one of the notes I had for it is, because it has run, it's got to be... I don't know, 80, 90, maybe 100 issues of this thing have been going strong through some very low points in the industry. And I always think of like, we read Palmer's picks and guys are like, I'm going to, this is going to be like a 100 issue story and they do like three. Jim, Jim Ballant has done it, man. He was right there, Weirdly. at the, yeah, right there at the speculator boom and, and he's got a couple dollars in his pocket, man. I don't know this guy. Is it like Chuck Alamey? Christian Alamy. Ah, uh, okay. I don't know how if Alamy is the right pronunciation or not, but this is the book. You know, you can see that they have a call out for. Lobo had a lot of good artists. A lot of interesting artists from the early '90s had a Lobo one shot or special. This is the Bloodlines Annual, and I like the art. It appeals to me. He is still, I believe, active in comics. Cool. In, in a pretty long career. Yeah, yeah. Not too familiar with the guy. Good looking stuff though. And then uh, we have. We have our Extreme Studios good old boys, man. First up on the docket is the uh, the Cato Kalin of Rob Liefeld Studios, <laughs> Ma Marat Michaels, who has been working with uh, with Rob Liefeld since since he was in high school. Yeah, and calls out some X Force stuff that he did, and basically describes his working relationship. You know, working very closely where Liefeld might be doing layouts and Merritt might be doing pencils over top or whatever, uh, just helping the process along. And my homeboy, Dan Frega, Frega Boom, doing his best, like Donnie Wahlberg impersonation. And <laughs> this, uh, you know, this is the post uh, New Kids on the Block era, man. And he was doing work on Bloodstrike here. Talked about, you know, meeting uh, meeting Rob at conventions early on. Uh, Frega now is uh, director of music videos, storyboards, music videos, uh, animated series. Long, successful career in the animation business. And uh, Merritt Michaels, you can find him at a convention near you selling uh, dead poo shirts and, uh, excuse me, dead poo prints where it's Pooh Bear, you know, Winnie the Pooh with a Deadpool outfit. Not only that, like, he drew one image that has the character with, like, uh, um, what is collo colloquially called a, a, a wife beater t shirt, right? A uh, tank top t shirt. And uh, so we drew, drew that one image, and whatever city he's in, you can get a dead poo <laughs> that has all of your city's team's logos upon said jersey. Wow. That is what... Um, How lucrative is that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know. It must be successful enough for him to keep doing it. And he probably beats me out like at, at any uh, convention. How good for him. Entrepreneurial. <laughs> Manga mania, Jim. First real in-depth... As in depth as an article as a Wizard Magazine could get for the amount of uh, material that's out in existence at this point in time, 1993. This is a massive survey of of, of publishers and their titles, mm -hmm. and some are manga and some are like Amer manga. So things like Ninja High School stuff that's drawn by Americans, but it's clearly influenced by manga or anime. Some of the highlight titles that that would have been mentioned in this article and we have we have a stack of books to to correspond with this stuff too man but uh Silent Mobius, Dirty Pair, Ninja High School you mentioned, Bubblegum Crisis, Nest Robber, Appleseed, uh Giver, the first mentions of a uh, Mobile Suit Gundam are in this article and uh, round round the one half are like the the sort of big titles and of course Akira you know, that's that's a given. So basically what they're doing here, doing a breakdown of like all the companies that publish manga and manga related stuff. So like Antarctic Press, that's your that's your ninja high school. Um, they they position Colleen Duran's uh, A Distant Soil as manga, but but I don't even think she would say that. Uh, then we get to like the Joe Duffy stuff. Now, Joe Duffy is the one who did the first English translation of uh, Akira and uh the comic that she's responsible for actually, I guess, fully writing, yeah, written by Joe Duffy, is uh, this this gimmick called uh, Nest Robber. And I think this got a Zeric Award at some point. We mm. looked at the, uh, the the Peter Laird grants for comics, and I think this got one, issue one or two. I think there were only two issues published. So Colleen Duran uh, pinups and stuff here? 
yeah, kind of an unusual book. Akira was a fascinating one. Um, around this time, 1993, November, they're soliciting the last issue of Akira, issue number 38, for probably the second or third time um, during like all our Wizard episodes. They solicited it a bunch of times. And it just kept getting pushed back more and more because it, it reads here that Otomo, in the American version, wasn't happy with the final chapter, the final piece. So he went in and like redrew a bunch of stuff. Now, with the speed that the mangaka are always known for these are like you know 40 50 page comics but it clearly took mr otomo quite a long time to to finish that stuff off and if you see those last pages of akira a lot of architecture in those pages but what we have here is is the amazing steve olive pro like proto computer coloring that was done like very early on and from what uh Olive told me early on in these days, he had to basically almost imagine what the colors look like output. He had to color it on a gray monitor. Oh, wow. Yeah. All of this anime, or all of this manga is unflipped. So one of the um, companies that's mentioned in this article is Studios, Studio Proteus. Yes. And this is uh, mainly Torrin Smith and then a team of, of people that would work together to bring manga through licensing and then partner with various American publishers, Dark Horse, Eclipse, I think maybe a few others. Uh, Tom Morzakowski would be a letter they would work with. So it was kind of this team. Founded in 1986, and I think it goes until 2004, 2005, something like that. So for decades, you know, was importing, I think he said 70,000 plus pages he brought over. But it was unflipped. You know, like we saw Akira in color, it was, it was a challenge for American publishers to figure out how do you sell this work. And so they would try things like color. You know, they would flip the artwork so that it read in a Western style. Um, you know, and they, these were just pioneers, like trying to figure out how do you connect this in, a, in, a, in the direct market, in a, comp, in, a, in a culture that is used to X-Men. Sure. And, and the culture is becoming more receptive at this point in time because this is when uh, Speed Racers on MTV and getting a big buzz post Robotech. Around this time, I didn't associate the big eyes with Japan. I just knew that there were the cartoons that had like the big eyes and I knew that it must have been of a piece, but yeah. I didn't quite know that this was Japanese stuff because even on American cartoons, um, a lot of a lot of Asian names in the credits at the end, so that it didn't look any different to me. So this is uh, Dirty Pair, which Adam Warren would go on to do a lot of comics with these characters. They were licensed for him to create new car new comics. But this is coming from anime. So this was another technique that these guys were trying to experiment with where they would actually cut up uh, anim animation cells, essentially, and create their comics that way in an effort to, again, bring these you know, very rich stories to American audiences. But how do you do that? Like, How do you make it make sense to Americans that may not have a wider point of reference? I believe this is Adam Warren's... I think this is the first Dirty Pair that he worked on. Amazing. Eclipse Comics. I always associate it with Dark Horse. Yes. This is really cool. I had no idea that it was first the Eclipse thing and just seeing like his very raw because he's he's very much graphomania, like fetishizes the art of comics. Uh, if you go to his Instagram, it's all life drawing stuff and like shading musculature and junk like that. Yeah, he does a series now called Empowered that's reproduced from pencils. Mm. Um, and he will, uh, in later Wizard episodes, he is going to take over kind of like the uh, the Brutes and Babes feature oh, interesting. and, and uh, show off uh, manga style techniques, man, for capturing speed and energy Very dynamic. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, this is a 1999 uh, version, so you get to see almost, you know, 10 years in the evolution of, of this look. Ultimately, a good set of marching orders, man, for anybody interested in, in manga at the time. It's an interesting snapshot of where things were at this time period, because this is still early days for manga. Yeah, and of course, uh, the byline is uh, Leia Hernandez, and, and she talked a little little manga uh, way back in the day, and it was last issue where Patrick Daniel O'Neill said, Hey, Leia, maybe you could put some things in front of me and change my mind about these Japanese comics. Doomsayer, Dan Jurgens talks about uh, bringing Doomsday back and some other gimmicks, Second Crisis, but uh, Jim, I'm going to be honest, didn't even read this thing. Yeah, I, d I didn't pull anything from this, really. It's We'll keep it rocking. I wasn't into Superman back then, and... Yeah. Keep that shit rocking, man. 
Leaping Lizards, peek into Jack Kirby's prehistoric past, a romp with Devil Dinosaur. I was like super stoked when I got to this because I'm like, man, that's awesome. Like we're doing this thing, this new thing. I hope this is a regular article, but it's actually really not. It's uh, it's just like the character profile that's been in almost everything, but uh, it's at least not. They're not just. They're not trying to glom on like a super popular A-list character. It's like a more interesting, weird, you know, Jack Kirby character. Pretty bizarre. There's stuff I really like about Devil Dinosaur. This is one of my favorite images in comics, period, that happens to be in Devil Dinosaur. Number four. So I figured I would bring that in and share it. The article, um, it's fairly critical of, of Devil Dinosaur. It's, it's definitely a weird comic. They don't mention, they don't frame it like it's a kid's book. You know, and I think that that makes a difference. You know, this is very much like a cartoon or something. Very different in tone than some of his other work. Even things like, I think this was contemporary with the run on Captain America that he did. Uh, Jack Kirby, when I say he. So I think that it's important to keep that context in mind. Is like, this was clearly aimed at a younger audience than some of his other work at the time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if... A lot of people, man, they don't draw Devil Dinosaur quite correctly. Like, it's all, like only Jack Kirby knows how to do it because people draw a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but Devil Dinosaur is not a T-Rex, man. Like, Jack Kirby has drawn T-Rexes, and I've seen what that looks like. This ain't a T-Rex. No. And I don't know what that thing above him is. <laughs> yeah, the missing link. <laughs> Hollywood Heroes, Andy Mangles, man. Uh, we're getting to a new season of X-Men, and they're talking about some of the cameo appearances of characters that are going to show up on the thing. So that's a long shot. Cable. It goes far beyond that even because what I liked about the show is when they would, uh, you know, cut to a TV screen, you would see Ghost Rider and like some real like deep cut characters. Always fun to see uh, the next like weird characters that would pop in there, man. A lot of animation news in this column. Tells from the Crypt Keeper, which ends up running three seasons. Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, which only runs one season, which is the Mark Schultz Xenozoic Tell yeah. um, adaptation. The Tick animated. Probably which, first mention of that probably here. And, and I think a very successful cartoon. It runs three seasons, and I think it's really well done and well regarded historically. So, yeah, I guess they're gearing up for a new season so you get a listing of all of these uh, upcoming shows. Talking about uh, Spawn Film Talks uh, for the first time here. There's some, there's some stuff in the air about that. Also talks about uh, the Beavis and Butthead film uh, is 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 on the horizon. Actually made me think about like this period of time because it's around sixth grade, and I stood up a date to the semi formal uh, <laughs> because of Beavis and Butthead do America, <laughs> and uh, this was in day and age when a young boy can easily get R rated tickets, and I stood up my date for the Friday night semi formal to see uh, Howard Stern Private Parts. <laughs> I said she could come with me, but she wanted to go to the dance. Fuck that! I made my choice. <laughs> uh not too much other stuff uh in here oh they're, they're talking about the um robocop 3 uh film in here and uh, there's a piece in the alan moore that we didn't mention that. That, that that i forgot but it's in my notes and it's that uh you know frank miller ultimately wrote robocop number two but it was offered to alan moore first and he turned it down that's an interesting little piece of trivia in that article yeah, it tells you a lot about the producers yeah, what they were reading what totally their minds the big were. stuff. Yeah, this comic thing is hot. Like, let's get the two big guys from the whole thing. Let's jump into Palmer's picks, man. Talking, Je uh, talking a uh, bone, Jeff Smith comic. For my money, uh, and the things that we've discovered and unpacked over the course of these wizard reviews, I've always been curious about the tipping point that made Bone a success, and I have to think that uh, Tom Palmer had a big hand in doing that. Man, it was mentioned five or six times in earlier issues, maybe more, uh, in a comic book magazine that sold 250,000 or more copies a month, man. That, that, is, that is a big boon. Yeah, the timing is perfect also because not only is Jeff Smith's bone, it's got some, some like a year under its belt, right? Like six, eight issues. It's a collection. Yeah. Like a collection is available when this column comes out, which makes it really easy for somebody who's reading this and saying, okay, sounds interesting, you can actually find this. Like some of the stuff that Tom Palmer will highlight might be a new series, it might be a series from a company that goes bankrupt. I think we just saw that last issue or the one before. So it's kind of perfect timing. Shine a spotlight on Bone and Bone is ready for that spotlight. Like here's the trade paperback, here's the next issue, you're good to go, you're all set. 
We get some origin stories about the creation of Bone here. Uh, the fact that Jeff Smith was drawing these characters since he was a kid, first off, but the first published efforts appeared in uh, the sort of Ohio University college newspaper, a strip called Thorn at that point. And this is the cloth that Jeff Smith is cut from. Uh, one of the things that Palmer points out is that he's not part of like the inbred uh, comics universe. Like the stuff that that Jeff Smith is pulling from, of course from literature it would be like Tolkien, but when it comes to comics, it's it's Walt Kelly's Pogo. It might be the first time the people my generation even heard the name Walt Kelly or Pogo because it was always closely associated with the Bone comic strip, even though, you know, Fantagraphics had collections and stuff uh, back in those days. Um, Palmer describes it a little bit in comparison to something like Charles Schultz Peanuts. He says, you know, it's very simple panel design and layout, which you could read another way in that it's very readable. It's very easy to read. And especially compared to the popular books at the time, things like, you know, a random issue of an image comic where it's pinups and strange layouts and characters breaking panel borders, you could look at Bone and it made sense visually. Like, it was very easy to follow. Somebody that hadn't read a lot of comics or weren't really deep into comics could look at Bone and easily read it. Bone is a great success, and and uh, that just simply is not possible if you don't have some entrepreneurial skills behind the matter. Uh, there are many, many good comics out there that deserve to be huge successes, but the artists are, uh, just keep their nose to the grindstone, keep working on comics. So early on, uh, when he was doing these college strips, caught the attention of big syndicates for newspaper comics. Uh, Jeff Smith wasn't appreciative of the deals that they laid out. You know, very possibly he could have uh, taken a deal from King Feature Syndicate, had a career uh, doing bone strips, and right now, you know, Noah Van Skyver could be drawing bone comic strips in your local uh, newspaper or some shit, you know? But he wanted full control. He wanted to own his characters. He wanted to uh, A or nay any licensing deals that would be done with the characters, and he's carried that spirit throughout. Uh, when we went to Cartoon Books and interviewed him for Tell Me Something I Don't Know years ago, he was talking about a meeting that he had with Scholastic for the first time. Art Spiegelman brought, uh, Bone, brought, brought he and Bone to uh, Scholastic, and during the first meeting, uh, Jeff and uh, his partner Vijaya talked about sitting there with the editors, and the editors had all the cartoon books, trade paperbacks with like markers and all these pages and stuff. And Jeff was like, no, like, we're not going to go through my comics page by page. Like, what are the major things? Let's talk about that. But I got to play in the catch, you know, so he's a boss, you know, and I've, I've seen I've seen him flex his boss muscles a couple times out in the wild. He's he's hardcore, man. He's for real. And uh, he and Vijaya, during our conversation, uh, he owned an animation studio, co-owned an animation studio. They were doing commercial works, and he sold his stake in the animation business back to the, the you know the other partners for seed money for cartoon books. But that was not going to be possible until he proffered proper business plan to Vijaya. Like this is how I'll be able to take this money, flip it, and make it so that we don't lose our house or something like that. The, the tandem agreed, and, and these motherfuckers are off and running. Yeah, it's it's one of the great success stories in comics, for sure. We often talk about the creator-owned big comics, you know, Walking Dead, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Bone is probably right up there. Uh, the other thing we saw in cartoon books was the shelf of all of the translated international licensed editions, and I think it's in nearly 30 languages. Um, you know, so quite goes on to be quite a success. Um, Ed, you mentioned, you know, the Tolkien reference. Yes. I think it's worth not glossing over that. You know, Lord of the Rings is, is something I've often seen this compared to story-wise. There aren't a lot of comics, you know, comparable to that. And it's something that comics fans are definitely, you know, there's a lot of comic fan crossover there, but not a lot of comics that can kind of scratch that itch. So in addition to very attractive artwork, there was a good story here. Yeah. And I think that that part, you know, you it, it was just so different than everything that was out in 1993. It was so different. It was a good story. It was clean, dynamic art uh, produced on a very tight schedule. Like, it just checked off a lot of boxes that nothing else was doing at the time. All ages friendly. 
you know, pretty unique then. And uh, it's, it's never, you know, it's never lost that audience. Uh, it, it continues today, you know, with different editions, with Scholastic, with cartoon books still publishing their big single volume. Um, it's just a hell of a testament to what you can do. Yeah, this book broke by way of Scholastic. It is in school libraries. It's in a lot of school libraries. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a gateway book for readers. Saw this ad a couple of times, man, when it was called Gen X, but now it's official. Gen 13. And the ad's in color. I remember it being in black and white in some of our we earlier We just efforts. need, uh, Jeffrey Scott just needs to change his name and we will be off and running. Truth. Toying Around This Month is a Marvel-sanctioned contest that will run through this column for, for readers to create figures based on the Midnight Suns line. So I'm sure we'll be seeing those in upcoming issues. My favorite part of toying around is almost always the the reader created figures. Agreed. So it's kind of cool that you know we've cited extreme as to seeing artists in these pages and pulling them out. So now Marvel is is kind of doing a version of that here. Hope we got some cool Johnny Blazes, man. This was a favorite character of mine just because he looked like a regular dude and he had a cool uh, sawed off shotgun. Hopefully, a cool blade maybe will come out of it. Wizard Comic Watch. Uh, well. Right here, actually. Michael Golden art, I believe. Not too sure. But it's uh, for the Suicide Run uh, series that sort of bled through Punisher War Journal, Punisher War Zone, and the regular Punisher series. Uh, I was picking this up at the time, and there was a cool Punisher that just had like almost like a Lucho Libre kind of mask that had the skull on it. Very cool. Highly recommended. It drew a lot of drawings from this. Learned, learned a lot about drawing from the, the, the Suicide Run series <laughs> of, of uh, Punisher books, man. But the Wizard Comic Watch, uh, X-Men 244, first appearance of uh, Jubilee. When I was uh, trying to figure out which, which comic I was going to include in my uh, extinction trade of X-Men Grand Design, it was between this one, which is probably one of the, one of the few uh, self-contained stories when the girls are going to the Mall of America or something, uh, or uh, the one that I ultimately went with, uh, issue 268 with Captain America and uh, Black Widow. But then this one, Dragon's Claws 5. Whenever you're hunting in the uh, quarter bins, you'll see Dragon Claws 1 through 4 and 6, six through whatever. But you never find uh, Dragon Claws number 5, which is the first appearance of Death's Head. But not the cool Liam Sharp Death's Head. This goofball looking one that is like far less cool. <laughs> Poor Marvel UK, I have questions. <laughs> Pick some of the wizard's hat. Jim, did you pull anything? I don't believe I did, no. The Gambit 1 uh, miniseries is cool because I was following Lee Weeks on the Daredevil work. Yeah, I liked Lee Weeks. And I followed him on to this, man. And he came to Pittsburgh Comic Con with Gambit Pages. And all that I knew about original art from that time period was when I would go uh, up to Ron Friends and he had like Kickers Incorporated pages <laughs> for five bucks. So I thought that was the price of original art. And I thought, well, maybe... You know, these are far more elaborate pages, and I love so many, but maybe they might be 40 bucks. And when I went up to Lee Weeks, man, and as a little boy, man, prepubescent probably, I was like, I would like to buy some original art, sir. He's like, I have nothing here, less than $300. And I thought he was a huckster. I couldn't believe he wanted such prices. Yeah, nothing much else. One of the things I am going to be making note of and paying attention for uh, in the coming months is when we start to see Moon Knight issues creep up man and we get the first glimmers of Stephen platt because that's going to be important <laughs> that is going to be important <laughs> <laughs> any number ones jim that that uh struck your fancy nothing for me no i didn't pull anything good and cheap section they're calling for iron man 215 216 i don't know the specifics it has to do with uh roadie roads but well, i can call your attention to buy the thing because of the md bright artwork who's a guy i really dug from uh the gi joe comics in like say issue 100 115 uh really awesome competent artist good looking stuff very fun solid foundation with a little bit of skew that makes it a kayfabe favorite man Interesting uh, top 100, September 1993, uh, Wolverine 75, the one where he gets his adamantium ripped off and we discover that his cl claws have been there his entire life and they're made of bones. Adam Kubert art of memory serves. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. And that image when he's got his blood claws, <laughs> I drew that one a lot too. I was doing a lot of copying at this time. That's what this issue like reminds me of is like, oh yeah, I was like drawing whole pages because I, I drew all of Youngblood. Team Youngblood number three, of which we saw the ad with the spawn, drew every single page of that. Uh, drew that Adam Kubert thing a bunch. Dan Panosian's uh, 
Profit is out there, issue num uh, in fourth spot. X Men twenty ninety nine is out at this point, man. But it's a pretty schizophrenic image. Only has three pieces up there. Marvel looks like they're riding their ship. Yeah, and here's the Glenn Fabry Bane cover that Wednesday Warriors like a lot. You kind of see it right there. Good cover. And then the top books are pretty much the Daredevil books where he gets his like new costume. And Elektra coming back. Oh yeah, couldn't forget that. Ren and Stimpy number one uh, marks marks the the. Uh, the Pretty top bizarre. 10. It is very bizarre, and one of the interesting things is they they have this flipped around a little bit. But uh, Dan Slott is the uh, writer on that, and I had no idea that he was such a such a seasoned uh, veteran because I you know I know of his name now, right? But had no idea that he sort of broke in doing these uh, Ren and Stippy joys. And this is this is worth noting uh, that this is in the top spot because Beavis when the Beavis and Butthead comic happens, it becomes pretty valuable for for a time. Wizard Market Watch, I didn't pull much from here. No, me either. One of the things I like about the top ten is that we have Dave Lapham showing up with uh, Warriors of Plasm. For for our podcast listeners, man, I'll go through the top ten. One, McFarlane. Two, Jim Lee. Three, Joe Quesada. Four, Silvestri. Five, Bart Sears. Six, Eric Larson. Seven, Sam Keith. Eight, Capullo. Nine, Bernie Chang. And uh, Dave Lapham rounds it out in the ten spot. Should we do the writers? One Gaiman, two Peter David, three Frank Miller, four Alan Moore, five John Byrne, six Jim Shooter, seven Fabian Nicieza, eight Ostrander, nine Mike Grill, ten Bob Layton. Talk about a weird couple of lists. I mean, just peculiar. The the stuff that you're leaving off of these lists, history is just not going to look at Warriors of Plasm. You know, Jim Shooter is number six best writer there. Like, just some very strange, head-scratching choices. It's this thing, they kind of like, almost all Hall of Fames work this way, where it's like, it's a big moneymaker for every industry that has a Hall of Fame, rock and roll, football, or otherwise. So you got to induct some guys. Maybe you, you skip a year and, and, like, get some real worthy talent. Well, and the other difference there is that they leave some time. Like, right, like yeah, let's, sure. let's reflect on who should be on this list, because five years after this, that is not the list you would be assembling, I don't think. No, sir. This looks like a Jason Pearson piece of art from yeah. Van Gargo. Yeah, there it is right there. Jason Pearson draws. Getting top billing, and he's pretty pretty new at the at this time, man. So high hopes for that kid. We'll see some more of him, because he, he definitely made some comics that I was excited about uh, probably over the next year. Oh, yeah. And uh, pretty much the last thing that I want to make note of is uh, the Big Cheese, which would be Garib Shameless and the Deathmate Boys in the Hood. Whenever there's a chappy app appearance, <laughs> that's going to get called out. <laughs> Uh, if I, as, as long as I catch it. And frankly, to be honest, he's the only guy uh, I recognize. Young chap, yeah. We can't, we can't leave without this one, man. Why don't you tackle that one, Jimmy? Yeah, we've talked in the past about Marvel Perennials. So to me, this is one of the books that could be a Marvel Perennial. I think this one... This is a book I remember strongly from the 90s. The Marvel's book with Alex Ross... Alex Ross had done some Terminator comics, but really this is the book that introduced Alex Ross to the world. Um, you know, would go on to do things like Kingdom Come and a million covers, but Marvel's was such a cool idea. The idea being the Marvel Universe through the eyes of, of regular people, people on the street. And Alex Ross is, this is an example of an artist being perfectly suited to a concept. This th would not make sense with a pen and ink kind of approach, but he had this unique portfolio and it was like, the perfect story to showcase his skill set. Agreed. So this is the first printed appearance of Alex Ross in the pages of Wizard. He is rapidly going to become a darling of this magazine, and we are not going to be able to escape his clutches after Marvels comes out, man. So this is absolutely worth noting. First printed appearance. We heard Marvels being bandied about in some text pieces earlier with no real creative names associated, you know, no Kurt Busiek, nothing. This is it right here. And in fact, uh, they don't go with that ugly uh, Times New Roman for the final printed, which is smart choice. And just taking a look at the uh, wizard profile that is going to be appearing in most of the issues that we cover from this point forward. Got a Jerry Ordway one. I've been very underwhelmed by these profiles so far. I'm not sure how long this feature runs, but nothing usually stands out. They're very by the numbers, kind of boring. 
nothing against Jerry Ordway or any of the people that preceded them in this column. Um, we know him from Wildstar at this time. He had done a, a long runs on Superman. I think he's painting a Shazam Captain Marvel book around this time. Maybe it's out or coming out soon. And my favorite note is who would he like to work with? Al Williamson. That's always the right answer. Right. Um, so sometimes like little things like that stand out as something that I'm, I'm excited by. And he's kind of a classic throwback style. So I think Al Williamson would probably make him look great. So that'll be all for this issue of Wizard Magazine. Stay tuned next week. We're going to be getting into issue number 28, man, with this uh, Matt Groening Bartman cover. That's a heck of a lineup. Besides Matt Groening in the top bill, Barry Windsor Smith and John Byrne. So we'll have fun with this one. Ooh, double, double fold out. Nice. It fits our camera just well, man. Jim, we better get out of here. I am ready, yes. All right. <laughs> hey, favors, like, subscribe, and follow the YouTube channel. Hit the bell icon, and we'll notify you whenever we have new vids available. You can find cartoonist Kayfabe merch at our spread shop. There is a link below the video to that. All right, Jim. Give them the marching orders, and let's be gone. Read more comics. <laughs>